thought it would be great to chat with you in advance of our upcoming tours. Today's session will last a little over 30 minutes with time for question and answers at the end. We'll discuss some differences between MBA and specialized master's programs, particularly in the US. Then we'll spend some time uh, talking generally about applying to business school. <clears throat> in this first half of the webinar, we'll look at the following. Why earn an MBA versus a specialized master's? What will the cu curriculum look like? How is an MBA concentration different from a specialized master's? There are obvious advantages why you may want to consider graduate study. So let's start there. That may be whether it's a specialized master's or an MBA. Here are some key things, career acceleration, developing new skills, increasing your salary, and even starting your own business. Going back to increasing your salary, um, according to the 2017 GMAC Corporate Recruiter Survey, MBA salaries reflect an 83% premium over bachelor's degree re recipients. The projected median salary for US MBAs is $110,000 versus only $60,000 for bachelor's degrees. And according to a quarter of employers, they responded that they'll even pay a premium for specialized MBAs. Now in comparison for projected masters in management, just for an example, its median salary still shows a nice growth of $92,500 as a starting salary and even other business masters ranging from 70 to 95,000. Again, this is compared to 60,000 for direct from bachelor's degree programs. If you're thinking of starting your own business, here are a few things just to uh, entice you as you consider um, how that can shape your, your program. Um, this may include uh, pursuing entrepreneurship courses at an MBA program. There's plenty of opportunity for business plan competitions. You'll want to look at uh, opportunities to get involved with on-campus business incubators. And most importantly, do not underestimate the network that you're going to develop through an MBA or master's program focused in entrepreneurship. So let's talk a little bit about the MBA. So why might you want to pursue an MBA? Here are some specific benefits and aspects of an MBA program. I'll give you a little context to begin with. For full-time programs in the US, it's typically a two-year program uh, that involves 21 months of study with the summer off in between the first and second year. The difference compared to if you're looking at European programs, many times you're gonna see that those are one-year programs. Now clearly there are going to be exceptions to this rule that I've just outlined. This is just a general guidance. There are one-year programs located in the US and there are two-year programs located in Europe as well as Canada and Australia. You can also consider the varying formats. It can be very confusing, um, but there's plenty of opportunities out there for you to pursue an MBA that is right for you in terms of format. Some of these other formats may include part-time programs, online programs, and executive programs, just to name a few. Each format is designed to cater to the needs of different types of students, and there is going to be, for sure, the right format out there for you. Overall, though, an MBA will help you develop skills across a number of core functional areas like finance, accounting, marketing, and management, just to name a few. Many times, MBA programs will also offer you the opportunity to focus your studies. This isn't everywhere, but many places you can do concentrations, specializations, or even consider doing a dual degree, which allows you to pursue two degrees in less time than it would take you to do those two degrees on their own separately. Ultimately, an MBA is proving you have a broad depth of knowledge and then giving you deeper focus in one or maybe two areas of interest that are specific to your career goals. Now, if we talk a little bit about specialized masters to better understand the difference, many specialized masters, you can generally complete these programs in about a year, and that's in the US. This saves you time and money out of the workforce. As you know, tuition can be quite expensive and your housing expenses can be expensive. So this is definitely something to consider. Unlike MBAs, many specialized masters don't ask for a minimum amount of professional work experience. Again, a difference. For MBAs, like I mentioned, they're going to generally ask for about two years of postgraduate experience after you've finished your undergraduate studies. Here are a few of the typical specialized masters that we see regularly offered at business schools. Accounting, finance, information systems, business analytics, project management, and marketing. Now, when you go and start your research, you're going to find many, many schools offer 
even longer lists of programs. Um, I know a couple of schools that offer lists as long as 20. So there's definitely going to be a program out there if you're wanting a more focused degree. In terms of career advancement, specialized masters can give you and ultimately do provide a deep, detailed depth of knowledge in specific fields. For example, if you know you're wanting to pursue a, a career in accounting or financial engineering or business or even data analytics, there, these programs give you very concise, detailed knowledge in those areas that are going to be much more in depth than you're going to be able to possibly pursue even in an MBA program. So that is something you really want to think about in terms of your career aspects as it ties to which graduate degree you may want to consider. With a specialized master's, you're certainly going to develop marketable skills that can build your resume and allow you to transition into this new field, even if you don't come from an accounting background, for example. Um, one of my former schools, we specifically looked for people coming from arts and humanities to go into accounting. Um, so it, it's really interesting in that way that um, it does allow you that career transition. Now to just recap, a primary takeaway of the key differences is that an MBA provides you with breadth and greater flexibility with transferable skills should you want to make a career transition later in life. The key benefits of the specialized masters is that you're gonna develop a very deep set of knowledge in a very specific area. It's gonna be shorter duration and generally lower cost as a result. So as we jump into the next portion of this presentation, We'll focus on how timing can play a part in the typical admission process, and then we're going to discuss some common admission requirements. On this slide, after you've completed the process of exploring what's important to you in a program, this list can be long. This may include location, it may be urban versus a rural environment, the size of the specific program that you're pursuing, you know, how many students do you want to be surrounded with in your classroom experience and developing that networking um, aspect that's so important in doing an MBA or a specialized master's? How do students engage with, with each other? Typical companies and recruiters that regularly work with that particular school look at the career placement data from those career offices. What are the types of jobs that people are coming out with? Where are they located? Um, are there opportunities for international experiences and study abroad if that's important to you? Are there club experiences? How engaged are those clubs and how active are they on campus? This is just a brief sampling to get you thinking about what may be important to you as you consider a graduate degree. So putting that aside, you've now narrowed your list of schools. That's where we're at now. You now wanna make sure that you understand some of the differences in how application processes work. You're going to find that these vary drastically from school to school, from MBA to specialized masters, and even within various schools themselves. Um, the term rolling admissions versus rounds are typical terms that we see. Rolling admissions basically allows you to apply almost at any time when you have and feel comfortable that you have a complete application that is going to give, present you in the best light. Rounds, on the other hand, are predetermined dates that a program outlines that you need to apply by a specific date, and they generally will give you a chance and tell you when they plan to announce the outcome of that particular round of admissions. This can range from three to four to five rounds, um, particularly for MBA programs. So you'll just want to familiarize yourself with that um, and how that works at the various schools and know that either way, that's how that school chooses to run their admission process, and neither is right nor wrong. It, it's how it best works for that particular program. <laughs> Finally, you're gonna to wanna to think about scholarships. How does timing affect scholarship decisions? Scholarships can, um, in terms of the timing, some programs are going to encourage you to apply very much early in the round process if it's an MBA program because there's limited funding available and they may run out of funding. In other cases, they, have a, they take a different approach to how their scholarship funding is awarded. The bottom line is you're going to want, to, again, to talk to individual schools to better learn how their process works once you've created that shortlist that we talked about earlier in terms of weighing those various factors. 
Now, talking a little bit about test prep. Um, a good piece of advice that I, I learned long ago at a conference was that it's great for you to plan ahead and take your tests early. One of the more frustrating aspects um, that we run into is, is students who aren't prepared and don't test early, whether that's the GMAT or the GRE. What you may not realize is that GMAT and GRE test scores are, are good for up to five years. So you, even if you're a senior in undergraduate still, this may be a great opportunity because you're actually in the mindset of test taking and all of that, and very close to the point where you're, you're ready and good to go in terms of taking tests. It's also not um, bad for you to even think about taking tests again. You shouldn't feel concerned. Many, many uh, prospective students over the years certainly take the tests more than once and even say three times. Um, what I can say is that in my 18 year career, I generally saw test scores rise between a first take, the second take, and even the third take. That being said, I don't want to discount how important it is that you put in the time that's needed to make sure you're ready to do your best and become familiar with the testing environment and test format. QS Leap, one of our other um, services, is a great resource to help you prepare for a variety of tests, and it connects you with a great variety of resources. So I encourage you to explore qsleap.com um, as you look at test prep and things like that in terms of your, uh, as you consider this part of the application process. <clears throat> Finally, let's talk a little bit about scholarships and financial aid. Um, again, you're going to notice a similar theme. Scholarships and financial aid are going to vary greatly from school to school and even program to program within a university. You're gonna to wanna to familiarize yourself with the terms merit-based versus need-based aid, um, as well as the specific financial deadlines at each program. Um, in addition to scholarships at schools, which generally is waiving a portion of the tuition, many programs are also offering assistantships um, or fellowships. Um, assistantships are generally going to come in the form of graduate teaching or research assist assistantships and they generally waive a portion of tuition just like a scholarship, but it's an exchange for you working with someone on campus like a faculty member or an administrator. So moving on to our next slide, we're gonna talk about QS events um, since that's our upcoming series. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, another great way to explore available programs is at the one of the 300 events that QS hosts worldwide each year. Our 2018 events, will span six continents and more than 100 cities in more than 50 countries. This is a great way face, to meet face-to-face -face with school representatives and get your questions answered. You'll learn about scholarship opportunities, and many times you'll even have the opportunity to speak with current students or alumni. Our upcoming World MBA and World Graduate School tours typically include panels and presentations like this one to better understand some of the things that we've begun to touch on today, along with an open format uh, fair to engage directly with admission representatives. Our other series of events that we're running this spring are our Connect events, whether it's Connect MBA or Connect Masters. These provide um, the opportunity for individual or small group pre-scheduled appointments with school representatives. A member of our team after you've registered will be in touch They'll have a conversation with you about your goals and what you're trying to accomplish and connect you with schools that are an appropriate fit and that also want to meet you. This series is better suited for candidates who are looking to apply within the next 12 to 18 months. So the last slide of this presentation, but we'll cover quite a bit of content, um, are some of your common application requirements. This ranges from the quantitative aspects, which are testing and transcripts, the professional experience component, which many MBA programs are looking for, letters of recommendation, and finally, essays and interviews. And I'll talk a little bit about how that ties into FIT. So, jumping with quant, the quantitative aspect. I can tell you that in all my time, one of the worst things after about two weeks into a program is hearing that one of the students that you recently admitted is not doing so well in some of their early on coursework. So this is where testing and transcripts come into play. 
I know for you, because this is generally what we hear, tests, whether it's the GMAT or the GRE, are one of the more dreaded aspects of the application process. Whenever I put my hand up with the in-person panels at events, this is what we hear. While dreaded, it's an extremely helpful tool for many business schools to help compare candidates from all around the world as it's a common test. It's also a great way to gain insight into your potential quantitative ability. How are you going to perform in those particularly with MBAs and finance accounting type courses? How are you going to perform and are you going to be able to perform in those quantitative coursework courses? It's important to check with each school to see whether they're going to accept the GMAT or the GRE. And then also you're going to find that some schools, particularly say online part-time and executive programs, may not require this component at all or you can request a waiver. So that's something to explore as you're looking at the varying formats of MBA or specialized master's programs. Another helpful tool that admission reps use uh, to help them ensure that you're going to be successful in the classroom is looking at your undergraduate or graduate transcripts. So with that, in particular, they're going to be focused, and you're going to guess, I'm going to use that word quantitative again, at your performance in those particular areas. One tip I can offer is that, um, and I did see this a lot, uh, especially if you come from a liberal arts or humanities background, if you avoided and quant coursework because you dreaded it so much during your undergrad, it doesn't mean that you can't do a quantitative program. What you can do though to get ahead of that is sometimes it may be helpful to take an appropriate course at a nearby community college and include that transcript at the time of your application. I would talk to individual schools that you're considering on your, your shortened list to hear from them directly about what coursework may be appropriate or if this option is needed and if it can be helpful in your particular application case. So next, let's jump over to work experience and how and talk a little bit about why professional experience is generally required for an MBA, why it may not be for specialized masters, and does it matter, and how it contributes in a classroom. So and many MBA programs will require work experience. As a general guideline, and I stress that these are general guidelines, Full-time U.S. programs, and I could expand and say North American programs, are usually looking for at least two years of experience. Part-time students generally have a little bit more experience with a minimum of around three years of experience. And you're going to find executive programs anywhere from even eight to ten years or more of uh, managerial experience. And that's a key differentiator for executive MBA programs. As a caveat, again, I do want to stre stress that this is general guidance and you're going to want to check individual websites. And I stress individual websites. You don't need to actually ask that question of school representatives on what their minimum requirements are, but also ask them about their averages um, and then the range of work experiences that you're seeing in the various format of programs you may be considering. Let's talk a little bit about the resume and how that's used in assessing professional experience. So typically your um, admission officers are using your resume um, in other parts of the world, they'll say CV, um, to assess your professional experience. What they're doing um, when they look at that is they're looking for your growth. Have you, have you progressed in terms of your professional experience? Now this can be at one company, it can be at multiple companies. They're also looking at your potential leadership ability. Schools are looking for also a wide range of experience. Diversity is crucial in the makeup of MBA programs. Diversity, whether it's industrial okay. professional experience or whether um, it's undergraduate backgrounds uh, and diversity on many other level levels. So um, diverse, I can't stress enough that diverse experiences in the classroom create a greater experience for everyone involved. Now, let's talk a little bit about letters of recommendation. And again, just giving you some general tips here. Um, the first being, letters of recommendation really help give us some insight. And again, not all schools are going to re require letters of recommendation, but they provide us with the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better, get to understand how you've contributed in your professional environment, um, whether you've progressed, and also, looking at your potential for growth down the road. What I can recommend for sure is that it's important as a first step to go 
Um, once you've decided and narrowed your list, ask whoever you're wanting to write a letter of recommendation, whether they're open to writing you a positive letter of, of recommendation that will support your application. With that, I'd also recommend strongly that you look at having coffee um, and sit down and have coffee with your letter writer. This is a great chance for you to explain why you're thinking about doing an MBA or specialized master's degree, why this is important in terms of your uh, potential growth in terms of career, and outline some of those aspects and answer the questions that may be helpful. You certainly, of course, don't want to write letters of recommendation um, for your recommenders. This is utterly taboo. But on the flip side, you may want to highlight, as uh, I've managed many, many people over the years, you may want to um, highlight some of your past experiences, um, projects that you've worked on that you think would be helpful in terms of highlighting. Um, so that's definitely something I would encourage in terms of letters of recommendation. So lastly, I want to talk a little bit about fit. Um, essays and interviews are generally how schools can better assess whether this is going to be the best fit program for you and vice versa, that it's, you are going to fit right in with this particular program, school, university. So let's talk first about um, essays. Um, the important thing with essays is make sure you're answering the question. Each school is going to have varying amounts of essays that they may require. They may not require an essay at all. Um, you want to make sure you answer the question as well as stick to the word count that they've assessed. One tip I will offer is that it can be helpful to go and um, after writing your first draft of your essay to provide that to someone else to get them without the question, that's the caveat there, without the question and have them come back to you and say this is what you were trying to answer. If you haven't found that you've answered the question correctly, I would suggest going back and redrafting and starting again. Make sure that you focus and get tips on the typical essay um, that many business school asks, which basically focuses on your past experience, whether it's undergraduate and professional experience. How does that tie to the program that you're applying to? And how does all of that tie to what you're trying to do in terms of your future? That's a very typical question that you're going to get, whether it's um, in the essay process or whether you get it during an interview. It's important that what you say in your essays also translates directly to what you respond in your interview as well. All of this is time to ensure you're making a huge time and investment um, financially as well um, in terms of pursuing a graduate degree. And so it's so important to make sure that the fit is right. The last thing I'm going to touch on um, today is interviews before we go into questions. What I'll tell you about interviews. Um, you're typically going to find these mostly with MBA programs um, and mostly full-time MBA programs. It's going to vary um, outside of that. Most specialized master's programs won't require them and many um, online and part-time programs won't as well, but full-time program, full-time MBA programs will. Um, the format of the interview does not matter. It can be an on-campus interview. It can be a Skype interview. It could be with a current student, alum, or faculty member. If the school has made the decision to empower that sort of approach with whatever format they endorse, certainly go along with that. The interview though, most importantly, is your chance to come alive and really connect and, and tell your story about why you're so passionate about wanting to pursue this particular program at this particular school. To make sure you've done your due diligence and research on the program. Be sure to come prepared with questions Treat it like a job interview so that you're dressed professionally. One tip if you're on Skype, make sure that you're dressed professionally, even if it's on Skype, and ensure that um, the background is appropriate um, for that environment as well. Lastly, um, have fun with that part of the process. All of this is helping to ensure uh, the admission process in general is to ensure that you are getting matched with the program that's right for you it's a lot of work, but that's the end goal is making sure that you're going to have a positive experience and go on to be an amazing alum of that particular program. So I think I've talked enough um, for now. Let's see if we have any questions um, um, that have come in. Okay. 
it looks like Jamie may have a question. Um, so let, let's go there and we'll take one or two questions and then we'll wrap this up for the day. Just one second. So Jamie's wondering how many programs should she apply to? Well, that's a difficult, I mean, I would rewind back and say from what I started with at the top of the presentation, in terms of thinking about what's important to you in terms of a program, uh, where I talked a little bit about urban versus rural, um, if career um, is really important to you. An example of this may be you wanna work in biotech, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, that space. It certainly is worth looking at schools in the Boston area as a result of that. If you're looking for more economic development, nonprofit experience, um, and those types of organizations, certainly looking in the DC area and making sure that those schools are in the consideration set is important. But you're going to find the most important thing I can say though, is that many schools place people all over the world and you can't focus simply on location for that. This is where you look at the career lists that you're gonna find on the career center websites of these various schools. Look at both the industries that schools are placing in as well as the job titles and the companies where they're located as well as placing. So all of those aspects are important. 